Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Franklin Williamson, and I teach at Gordon State College. Uh, I'm excited to get uh, to be able to take part in this virtual exchange program between Gordon State College and uh, Aberystwyth University. Uh, I've been asked by my colleague there uh, to make a short video introducing myself and talk a little bit about uh, kind of my intellectual biography. So, question one, introduce yourself. My name is James Franklin Williamson. Uh, interestingly, I'm from uh, the town of Griffin, Georgia. It's where I was born and grew up. And uh, Griffin is about 20 minutes away from Barnesville, which is where uh, Gordon State is located. So it's rather unusual for an academic to uh, wind up teaching at a school that's close to where that person grew up, uh, but I guess I got lucky in that respect. Um, I earned my undergraduate degree in history uh, from the University of Georgia in 2004. I earned my master's degree uh, from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill in 2008, and I finished my PhD there in 2013. Uh, and I've been teaching uh, here at Gordon State since uh, 2013 also. So question two, what do you research? I'm a modern German historian. Um, so we typically define modern Germany as 1871 to present or so. So 19th century, 20th century Germany. Uh, my research field is... Uh, situates chiefly in the post-45 period. So I, I look at the history of the Volkstrauertag holiday in the Federal Republic since 1945, uh, and the associated uh, East German version of that holiday, the Gedenktag für die Opfer des Faschismus. So these are, these are essentially the German versions of Armistice Day or Memorial Day that we have in the States, so I look at the history of, of memory, of how people have remembered, how they have narrated the past. Specifically, not so much their individual experiences of, of military service, but collectively how Germans as a society have talked about and thought about military service and death, uh, and wartime, uh, sacrifice, things like that. How they've talked about those ideas and how they have changed or, or remain the same uh, over time. So that's my research field. Question three, how did you get into that topic? Well, so this is a fun story. Um, I told you I grew up in the state of Georgia, um, which, uh, if you remember from your American history classes, was part of the Confederacy uh, during the American Civil War. So there's lots of Confederate monuments everywhere. There's a Confederate Memorial Day holiday, lots of people with Confederate flags. And this was long before everyone was talking about it, just when I was a child growing up in the 80s and 90s. Um, however, that was not what I wanted to do. I went off to college wanting to study ancient history, Roman history, um, but I got tired of taking Latin classes while I was in college, uh, as we all do. Uh, so instead I took French and German, um, and I took a military history class that was taught by a, uh, a war and society type professor. Um, uh, if you're not, if, you may already know this, but if you're, if you're not really into military history, there's, there's basically kind of a, of a divide between people that like to do kind of the operational, you know, this unit and this battle and these soldiers here, or sort of the face of battles, or here's what it's like in the trenches, that people that like to write that type of military history, and over here people that say, okay, here are how here are laws that govern, you know, how these products are made, or or how um, mili how large militaries can be, or what budgets look like. They talk about sort of the the larger impact of warfare on civilian society, or the role of the military in civilian society. Um, and that doesn't mean these are unrelated fields, but, but typically military history people t fall into kind of one or the other camp. So I was kind of in the war of society camp. I got really interested in the ways that warfare impact um, people who are not standing on a traditional battlefield. I wrote my undergraduate thesis on armaments production and labor policy uh, during the First World War in both the UK and Germany. So a lot about the 
uh, auxiliary service law in Germany and the Defense of the Realm Act and the Shells and Fuses Agreements and stuff like that in, uh, in the UK. So I, I sort of was thinking to go into graduate school, okay, I'm going to be writing about kind of labor policy and munitions manufacturing and that sort of thing. And then I had the chance to go to Germany uh, and I saw lots of these cemeteries and plaques and churchyards and uh, sort of uh, subtle but still present commemorative aspects uh, of, the, of the ways Germans, at least at some time, had talked about military veterans. And it reminded me very much of growing up in the American South in the shadow of the Confederacy. Um, so I began to be uh, feel I was really, really curious about um, how Germans kind of navigated this, this um, difficult question of feeling sad, but also feeling, you know, contrition. Uh, because these soldiers did a lot of terrible things. Especially because in the United States, at least up until recently, uh, public representations of the Confederate past tend to be separated from discussions of um, slavery or other, other, uh, other aspects of the Confederacy that, that did not exist uh, on the battlefield. So uh, the, the idea, the, the question of sort of expressing sorrow and feeling remorse, you know, for this person. Uh, but how do you reconcile these feelings of sort of sorrow with, um, you know, perhaps, you know, criminal actions that this person committed or something like that, right? Um, so so, the, so the, the, the German past kind of rung this bell that woke up uh, things that I remember from childhood, but I stuck with the German context. I wanted to keep going to see what I could find there. Okay, that was question three. Question four, why is your field of history important? So um, I answered this a little bit. Uh, you know, this kind of awakening uh, in how Americans talk about the history of the Confederacy and the American Civil War and the role of slavery, this is a pretty recent phenomenon. Now, historians have known that for a long time, but the general public typically has not engaged in this type of discussion that, that you all might have witnessed or heard about over the summer. Uh, however, uh, even before the current conversations in the U.S. about American history and how we make sense of it, um, as we are seeing in the States, when historians talk about history, uh, and then when the public talks about history, they are often not talking about the same thing. Uh, to many, at least on this side, to many people who are not academic historians, when they talk about history, uh, I think it's fair to say they are seeing a chronicle of names and dates, you know, maybe at best. At worst, they're seeing uncritical hagiography or, or heritage, right? Just sort of this uncritical acceptance of this is why this happened, and they don't ask any questions. Uh, and that's understandable to an extent, given the, I would say, lamentable way that history or social studies has been taught in K-12 classrooms, uh, typically American students in uh, primary school learn about uh, history as sort of lists of names and uh, dates to memorize for multiple choice exams. There, there's very little room for extended analysis or they don't get a chance to practice making uh, historical arguments and supporting those with evidence. And so clearly there are far too many people who think of history as something that's just fixed. It's done. It's over. It's something that already exists. And it serves the purpose maybe to applaud or glorify someone or something. Side note, yes, that can be the case, right? If we look at the history of how societies remember their past or how they talk about their dead, yes, societies create holidays, they create rituals, they build statues because people want to show respect or offer praise to certain things that they think are good, right? But of course, that's historically situated in space and time, right? So far too few, far, far too few people understand history as an act of interpretation. And so I think my research field is important because I'm trying to establish the history of how people have interpreted these ideas and, and to establish that, that, that these are concepts that, that 
uh, are situated in a certain space in a certain time, and therefore they must be open to a degree of change and also continuity. There must be a beginning and maybe an end. And that if we can see the ways Germans talked about, again, these issues of military service, soldiers' deaths, if these have a, a, a sort of beginning, middle, and end, if we can see changes across time, then we can understand that ideas such as heroism or service or duty or sacrifice, these ideas are not eternal, right? These are, these are not, these are not uh, concepts that exist everywhere all the time exactly the same, but they are understood, and they must be understood as products of circumstances, of choices, of certain structures, um, and, and they, they can be dissected, right? They do not exist in and of themselves, right? Um, so, so I think my project is, or I should say my research field is, is important because um, I can lend these types of examples to public conversations, right? I can challenge my students using the examples I can call from my own research background to, to challenge students or just audiences in the public to question their own assumptions, right? Question why it is that they believe this idea is correct, this idea is incorrect, uh, you know, ask themselves, why does this statue exist and another one not exist? And not simply take for granted the interpretation of history that they have been given or that they've learned in school, but to understand it as as a conscious set of choices, as a, a, as a narrative explanation that was created by one or more authors and not just simply handed down uh, fully formed. Because if we can understand that History, as we as we think about it, as 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 we as we conceptualize it, if we understand that it's a product of choices of, of available evidence of of, an, of interpretive strategies of theoretical models, then we can also understand that there's more out there that we don't know and that needs to be discovered. All right, my phone is ringing, so I guess I better stop talking now. I look forward to hearing what you have to say and talking more about these and other topics. Thanks for being here.